Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we have quite a bit to cover this morning, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing as we open his word and that of his prophet before us at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for your scripture. We thank you for your prophets. We thank you, Father, for this blessing that you have provided before us. We know, Father, that we have sinned, that we have not walked in the path that you have set before us. We pray today, Father, for this movement, for the members of the movement, for the movement as a whole, for our friends that have remained within a church that is in darkness. We ask, Father, that we may be able to accept the light that you are providing and accept the light so that we may continue walking along the path so that as this light that shines behind us is revealed, we may see that our steps are sure. Mm -hmm. Guide us now, direct us in this meeting. Show us that Father, which we need to understand for this time so that we may be more prepared. For this, we ask, we thank you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, yesterday we left off in Judges 2.16 and 2.17. Now, our overview here is under the premise that the second chapter of Judges has a, an application for what has gone on within this movement from 2001 to potentially up to 2023. This is going to be our discussion today. This is going to be the points that we are going to assess. And if possible, we may either today or tomorrow get to laying out some of this upon a line to see how this can fit and how this would have testimony to us today. So as we look at Judges 2.16 with the alternate reading, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Now, when we're talking about judges, are we not talking about those that not only bring a message, but those that bring a message clearly to help us to see our failure and our need of faith. I mean, the overarching point that I was being led to at the beginning of the study of the book of Judges is that we're going to find that in Judges, we are going to find examples of righteousness by faith. When we go through the study of the book of, of Judges, there are those like Shamgar, like Gideon, like Deborah and Barak that are brought to our attention as warriors. But while they are warriors, are they also not delivering a message?
The reason I ask this question is, have we not had a message through Elder Jeff to help us understand the first and the second angel's messages? Was this not the ultimate foundation and reason for future for America? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be looking at these in this way, we need to be considering how these verses that we're looking at right now have impact upon us today. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the, what we're operating on. Okay. And yet they would not hearken unto the judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. Okay, so one thing we know is the, the spoilers are mentioned in verse 14, right, okay. which means 2014. And, you know, so we dealt with this yesterday, but just if, as we look ahead, we have to remember that, that this is 2014 where a division comes into the movement. And, and this is the spoilers, right? Right. That we're talking about. And... Um, so these are brought in by God because of a fault in the movement. Correct? That's why the spoilers come. It's God's anger against the movement for how it's operating. Um, doesn't mean it's not God's movement. Doesn't mean it doesn't have truth. But there's a problem that exists. And so that problem's manifest in the divisions that happened in 2014. Now, of course, these had already, the forsaking of God had already occurred, right? The forsaking of the proper methods of study had occurred. And we can see that in, in the preceding verses. And that's going to go all the way back to uh, 2010, taking these verses as years. So we're going to see this progression, and then we get delivered into the hands of the spoilers, where we first for the average person in the movement, all of a sudden realize there's this division that's been going on and been brewing behind the scenes. And um, this affects the ability of this movement to function. That is, it throws uncertainty into the movement. So in verse 16, when it says, nevertheless, the Lord raised them up judges, um, in this context, this must be uh, representative of of a message that's happening at that time. So it can't really refer to Jeff per se, because he's he's sort of earlier in this history. So something happens in 2016, and in 2017, it says that they don't hearken to those judges. Right? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you. Yeah. 2016 and 2017, to my mind, is about the time where you, Stephen, and Odilio began to show messages from history that have a, a basis for the movement itself. Yeah, well, I don't know about Odilio because I, I never knew him until 2019. But I, but, think Stephen um, did, I think Stephen did before that. Yes, Stephen probably did. When did you know Adilio, Stephen? Yeah, that would have been the camp meeting in, uh, in Holland. So that was around December 2016. Okay. So I first met him. So Jeff was presenting Panium and Raffia. Okay. So you were there in the one on December 7th, 17th? No, or, that was um, that was in Wales. I wasn't there, but Jeff basically heard what uh, was presented on December the 17th. 
And then he asked Chawa to if he could present that in Holland. Oh, okay. That's when he presented it then. Okay, okay. So, so right at that time. So we have 2016, we have a bunch of things coming in uh, to the movement. One is Ezekiel, the understanding of the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel. Like a lot of people, pieces are put into place. So for me, it's not, the judges aren't so much individuals, uh, but they're the truths that are being presented that okay. are, are now going to be rejected. It's not All so right. much who presents it as, as that God gives light to the movement. Movement really is not, and this, this light would be helping the movement it would be getting it back on track, not just because it's, it's you know, the chronology is an important in and of itself, but because of what it was pointing to, especially in 2017, when we brought Samuel Snow's letters together. This was a message that should have united the, the movement. Um, and it even took Jeff a year until he recognized the importance of Samuel Snow's letters. So, so there's all this light coming from this chronology, putting things together, because it's helping us understand our connection to Millerite history. That's why it's important, not just for the sake of chronology itself, and not because of the people who are presenting this light, because God is just giving this light to whoever can receive it. So there's nothing special about me or Stephen or Adilio or anyone else, other than that God chooses who he's going to use to deliver light. What matters is the light itself. Okay, but what I guess what I'm getting at is this, this light, as it's being presented, was coming through individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, the light itself being rejected, we're seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely, and we see that in 2017, you know, because there's something so profound in Samuel Snow's letters that was answering all of the questions that were being agitated at the time. Okay. Organization, the, the prediction before midnight, um, you know, what kind of direction the movement was going to take, the different controversies that were happening with individuals. All of these things could have been answered if the movement had taken the focus upon, off of what was going on and just looked at the light that God was giving. But they, they didn't do that. Like I had, you know, I traveled to the airport after I was there in 2017. So in September, I traveled because I left uh, when Parminder did. And um, so we, we both flew out at on the same time. So we traveled to the airport and we talked together while we were traveling and then we were at the airport for a while. He took a different flight than I did. But he just could not agree that there was any significance in Samuel Snow's letters. And, and now I understand why, because no. it was totally undermining everything that he was doing. Is it also possible that he didn't understand, want to understand Samuel Snow's letters because it was providing a testimony against him? Well, yeah, that's that's my point. Is he? I, I think he must have seen the significance of what was being said, especially as I look at later on. But at the time, I, I just couldn't understand why he he was so dismissive of this chronology. And and anything to do with the prediction before midnight, just totally had nothing, no interest in it. Um, and these are the things that were being discussed by everyone else, but he wasn't wanting to discuss them. So, so definitely he had an agenda that he wanted to push and these didn't fit into his agenda. And, and this even goes back earlier, you know, when I first met him and, um, I was showing him the 70 years captivity and how this all worked out and 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 he just had no interest in it and yet he wrote about it and talked about it in his framing of it but anything i had to say about it he he just dismissed it he 
email discussion. He loved him emails. He, he would just send objections, but never sort of interact beyond that. So, so when we look at that history, 2016, 2017, and 2018, we can see that God is giving light to this movement that is going to be rejected just as these, the work of these judges, you know, it, it's in a sense delivering them, but the people ultimately reject what was happening. Okay, now. In a sense, going to deliver them out of the hand of their enemies, but we're going to see here, and, and see, that's why 2018 is interesting, Judges 2.18. Right. Because they do get delivered, but then the judge dies in 2019. Now, of course, we're going to apply that to Jeff because now it's in the singular. Right. Right. Instead of these judges, he raised up judges. Now we're going to have this specific judge who's dead. But, but okay, so you go on, and uh, I'm talking too much. Who said? Me. Well, I don't know that I agree. Now, and when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge. So this is, again, singular. Mm -hmm. and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And as, as references here, we would have Joshua 1.5. There shall not be any there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses. So I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Now, this from Joshua 1.5, I think it has application with John the Baptist. It has application with William Miller. I think it has application with Elder Jeff. Yeah. And then the other, we are told to see Genesis 6.6. 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Deuteronomy 32, 36. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. Psalms 106, 44 and 45. Nevertheless, he regardeth their affliction when he heard their cry. And he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. So those that are sighing and crying for the abomination that is done in the land will be those that God will hear. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so for Jeff, if we take Judges 2, 1 is 2001. Right. Um, Jeff, Jeff is there before 2001. I mean, right. he's part of that, the weepers, right? Right. And, and of course, that's going to continue. It just doesn't end. Right. And, and Jeff is then raised up like Joshua, like the judges, to, to give this, um, this message, which is growing and developing. Now, of course, we can see the problems, the problems that exist within the movement. But in 2018, God's going to repent uh, because of the groanings by reason of them that oppressed and vexed them. So we have our enemies who've been attacking this movement. So what was given in 2018 is, is kind of a double-edged sword in a sense, in, right. in that respect, because we get this time setting, right, which from the external point of view, I mean, one of the reasons why people were reluctant to accept time setting is because it's so vilified within Adventism. Any kind of thing that, that even hints at time setting, for the vast majority of Adventists, it's just fanaticism. So now here we get this message, which Jeff had, had been opposing for a long time, 
the idea that you know we could set any sort of dates you know and and i was definitely with him on that and i still am um because you know it's, it's very clear in the spirit of prophecy so back in 2018 we get this time setting but jeff recognizes that it's from god that we in a sense had time attached to this movement now the real question was could we predict the events that Ellen White said we can't predict? And my answer to that was no. Ellen White's statements are still valid. Parminder and Tess were saying Ellen White's statements are no longer valid because we're in a different dispensation. And that, that opening of the door to this type of dispensationalism um, was something I had to examine. I knew what was happening even back in 2018. I knew what Parminder was proposing. And, and then I watched it develop through 2019. And it seemed pretty clear that this was, this was a big choice. And it was a big choice for me personally, because that type of dispensationalism is the type I was raised with, that my dad promoted, that in the past, the people just didn't know the truth. And as we progress, we come to understand things more clearly. And there's a kind of truth in it, in that light is progressive. But new light never rejects the old. So, so there was that, you know, for me, it was pretty clear that this couldn't be new light once I examined it. But, but that wasn't clear to everyone. Um, so in 2018, we have this light that's given to us from God. And, and it's, it's called judges, but there's also a judge. And, and this judge, I can say, would be Jeff, because he's the one who discerns and makes that decision to accept this message. Without Jeff accepting that message, this movement wouldn't have accepted what Parminder was saying. Okay. Right. Now, 2019, it says it came to pass when the judge was dead. So, so Jeff, in a sense, held in check some of this fanaticism, even though it was around him and he was being un unaware of what was going on. That is, he would get the reports of what was going on in a distorted sense. So he would hear about, you know, Parminder's teaching something different than you, you know, he had talked to Parminder, Parminder would just agree with him, whatever he said, say, well, people are just misrepresenting this. And of course, misrepresentations do happen. People do misrepresent what other people say. So, so you know, there's kind of a, well, maybe that's possible from Jeff's point of view. People are just misunderstanding Parminder because he's not easy to understand. But once Jeff is dead, 2019, according to the Omega, um, they're now going to corrupt themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their doings nor from their stubborn way. And this definitely describes what happened in 2019. Well, let's also look at it this way. Okay. As we read the verse, and it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They let nothing fall of their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And here again, they ceased not from their own doings. Now, in making this application of 2019, mm -hmm. we have a time period where Elder Jeff retired, quote unquote. Yeah. I yet remember the phone call. Very excited. The brother that calls me says, we have a new leader. And my attention was completely on what he was saying because this didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. 
the way that this is written, and I don't know the Hebrew, in following other gods to serve those gods. Right. Many yeah. within the movement chose then to begin following Parminder and Tess. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what was written in scripture. It didn't matter what was written by Ellen White. They were going to follow after whatever Parminder and Tess told them, and this was going to be the way it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And they chose to bow down to them. We saw this occurring with what happened in Germany. Mm -hmm. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Mm -hmm. We have all seen the effect of what has occurred here. Mm -hmm. There are multiple people that chose to give up the warnings of Ellen White because Parminder and Tess said, you don't need to live in the country. Go back, live in the city, because that's going to be the witness that you're going to give. Mm -hmm. You don't need to accept the health message, especially as it pertains to dress. Yeah, well, he, almost all the health message is abandoned. Right. And, and, it, and it's very interesting for me because... Parminder had quite extreme views in my in, in my estimation on on dress that that just are we're taking out of context statements in the spirit of prophecy and and I know that's a sensitive point for some people but the idea of long sleeves that men have to wear long sleeves uh, you won't find this anywhere in the spirit of prophecy when she talks about the limbs being covered she's talking about little children which is the fashion of the day to have little children running about when it's cold with their legs and their arms uncovered. Right. And, and, you know, so Heidi and I went through all the statements we could find in the spirit of prophecy. There was no support for that. So Parminder held on to some of these views, which I've seen other people have, but he abandoned them completely. You know, it, 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 was, it was just like, I've never seen something happen so quickly with so many people, I mean, I've seen it happen with an individual who can be conservative Adventist one day, and the next thing they're just totally in the world. But to see it happen with such a large group of people, and to have it see it so much uh, justification for that, that they have created to to come to that conclusion, just is really remarkable. And and this verse describes this um, to me: they cease not from their own doings. And, and and the the Hebrew there says um, like let not let it not fall right so um, in this sense here they, they wouldn't recognize their sins and they were stubborn in in that respect right right so they they were they were stubborn or um, uh, the idea is that this is a beaten path conversation matter of life the road that they have taken it's 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 this path that they have they've laid out in their lives in the in the past and so now they're on this path in which they will not turn from and and that this to me is is one of the keys this this verse how well it describes 2019 as well as the other verses before it, uh, describing those years. I agree. I mean, there are those that I have known within this movement that I've had to watch quietly and carefully how in the years prior to 2019, there was with them some great joy of what was occurring. But when it came to 2019, they were finding that there were certain things that they could not and they would not accept. 
and it has led to some additional fracturing, especially where by 2019, we began addressing and dressing, addressing very completely July 18th. Yeah. Now, as this continues, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I will also not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Yeah, so if you look at 20 and 21, I mean, this describes the history connected with July 18th and all the way to December 25th, 2021. Right. So 2020, um, if we look at the anger of the Lord's hot against Israel, so we know that God's people here, this movement in this context, um, it experiences this disappointment, but we see why. Because now, it's transgressed against the covenant, God's covenant, and yet we expected those prophecies to be fulfilled. And it's going to be manifest in the declaration in December 6, 2020, and then by the time we get to December 25th, 2021, we have a decided uh, um, division that occurs in the movement. The movement is not working together. And uh, so, and this had been progressing in through that period of time. But as many people still in the movement agree with the declaration of December 6th. Okay. Now, if we look at the, the other verses that the translators had used here, mm -hmm. we would look first at Judges 2.14. So, when we are looking at this portion with Judges 2.20, we find a comparative with 2.14. So can we then address that, two, that 2014 and 2020 are almost like bookends? They're almost companion years. Yeah. Basically, if you could compare the, the letter that was written in 2014 by, I believe it was Jamal that wrote it. Okay. That condemned Jeff. Okay. And the declaration in December 6, 2020 that condemned, um, well, I guess, any of the people supporting July 18th. Right. Uh, those would be comparable as bookends. Okay. So we'd have a beginning and we'd have an ending. Yeah. So in this situation, Judges 2.14, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of the enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. In 2014, could the movement stand before the church or any of the Protestant churches in their explanation of the 2520. In 2020, could the movement stand before other members of the movement mm -hmm. in explaining July 18th? All of these are being typified in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. Then we come down here, Joshua 23, 16. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourself to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given you. Finally, Joshua 23, 13. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. 
but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land, which the Lord hath given you. Yeah. So we see this manifest. So we have this warning in Joshua. We see it manifest in the period of the judges. Right. And, um, and we also see that, um, you know, so in 2020 and 2021, you can see this progression. Of, now, we, you know, we compared in cha uh, 2014 with 2020. Um, we don't have the spoilers here, per se, mentioned, but this is a continuation of that line. Right. And, um, but this is the transgression of this covenant, right? So we had a lot of focus over the last, you know, in the first half of this year, um, focusing upon this covenant in your studies and and that we need to go into covenant with God. That is that covenant exactly. renewed. Now, when all of these things were happening in 2014, the focus always was that the people were the problem. That is, whenever rebellions arose, the focus of the movement, and this would include Jeff, but the leadership of the movement, would look at these people as the problem. But we weren't recognizing that there was an inherent problem in us, in how we were dealing with, with error, and that we also had errors, not just in our understanding of biblical truth, but errors in our character, errors in our beliefs about how things should be done. And, and these, these things had come from the world. Uh, we weren't operating on the principles that are set down in the spirit of prophecy. Even with the school of the prophets, which was professing to, to follow the council on, um, on, on how we should run our schools, there was many, many things that had transgressed plain counsel in the spirit of prophecy because we were just running the schools based upon worldly worldly policy and this created all kinds of problems with the people that came there as students and the students were the ones that were blamed the, the leadership never took the responsibility for the behavior of those underneath them which is to me uh, you always have to take responsibility for what you do. If you're running something and you have problems, you can't blame the people. You can't blame the students. You can't blame your employees. If you're a businessman, you have to, to recognize that the problem lies. The responsibility lies in you. And, and that's a hard thing for people to take. It's so much easier just to find the fault out outside of yourself. So no. all of the things that have been happening in the movement were meant to correct us, but it wasn't correcting the movement. And that's what has to happen as we go through the rest of Judges chapter two. That we have to see that there is going to be this testing that's going to, whether we can keep this covenant, whether we can walk with God, whether, whether or not we can be Christ-like in how we operate. Agreed. Now, as we come into these next two verses, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So we have to read this this other verse before it to really to, to really put this in perspective. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. That through them, the nations that Joshua left before he died, I may prove Israel 
-hmm. whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Now, Are we not currently in a proving time in 2022? No doubt. Now, and one thing that this brings to mind, going back to Parminder's The Wheat and Tares. Right. That had arisen back in 2016, probably the sure. late 2015. Um, this idea that we were going to have this pure church, that we were going to root out the tares, and we were going to have this church triumphant that what that did not make mistakes we were going to create this organization that was perfect this is this is what was being promoted by parminder and by tabo and others and but we can see that god doesn't take away the nations which are left and he does this for a reason the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. Why is that? I mean, there's several reasons. Well, the biggest reason I would look at is that if you if you pull up the tares, you're also going to root up the wheat. Right. So that means there's precious people who are being deceived, um, and and they need to see God needs to redeem us. I mean, it's it's the whole reason why sin is here in the first place. God could have just kept rooting up evil, but it never resolves the problem. Agreed. Right, because the problem is something that has to be resolved. I'm, I'm having a discussion with a guy on Facebook presently over last generation theology. And it's kind of interesting in that there, there's a guy, I can't remember his name, he did a video. And then this other guy watched the video and he promoted this video. And, and what this guy is saying that ML Andreessen minimized the cross and the accomplishments of the cross when we see, when we teach that there needs to be this final generation to vindicate God's law. And I mean, it, it's, it's just an old heresy repackaged in, you know, for conservative Adventists. Right. Um, but, and it's pretty easy to see, you know, where this leads. But when you look in an M.L. Andreessen, in the book that, that they're quoting from, in the previous chapter, he clearly quotes the spirit of prophecy that, that shows that the cross is everything that, and what was accomplished at the cross. And all those things that were accomplished at the cross need to be accomplished again in his people. That's what the whole sanctuary service is about. What Jesus accomplished at the cross, what Jesus accomplished by his life, by his death, and by his resurrection, has to be demonstrated in his people for sin to finally be eradicated. And so God allows these things to continue because he is not concerned about the present. He's concerned about where everything leads, the future. And our characters are being developed by these trials that we're going through in what's happening in the movement. Right. And, and we're all hopefully learning who we are, that we are very unchristlike, that we are not what we imagine ourselves to be. But more than that, because the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, of sin because you believe not in me, and righteousness because I go to my Father, and on judgment because the prince of this world is judged, and you shall see him no more. These, this progressive three-step testing prophetic message, we want to bypass it. But it's the very things that we're going through at the present time that are being illustrated by these lines that we have to embrace as God's um, correcting judgments upon this movement and upon us as individuals.
See, without them, we can imagine we're good, right? If I lived on on a, on a uh, in a world where I never knew any other person, I could live a pretty righteous life, possibly. Possibly. At least in my own imaginings. Right. But I would have no conflict with people. But, you know, I still might have sin in my heart, but, you know, I could justify it all, right? Because that's what people do. But as we deal with all of these things unfolding in this movement, they are meant to be there so that we can see we are not righteous. And the question is, are we going to focus upon justifying ourselves in, in these various conflicts we have with others and, and condemning them? Or are we going to be honest and recognize that we are no different than them? And, and that's really the whole thing of being tested. It's, it's a preparation here. It's this trying. The trying of your uh, faith worketh, worketh patience. And, and, and so we, so that's what we're going through. So it, it describes it very well. What, what has to happen in order for this movement to come to the point where it can actually be doing the work that God asked us to do? Yeah, we either come out as as gold tried in the fire or dross for the dross. And sometimes sometimes that gold gets destroyed. Yep. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. In applying this to 2023, this is a very fearful statement. Well, and I think part of the question here is, so if we're looking at 2022 and 2023, that this is describing our history presently and 2023, our history still in the future, um, we can say that the tares are still going to be among us. Right. That... Now, I, I take it, though, because it ends at 2023, that, you know, that this movement will have some kind of, it's not going to be a perfect church. It's not going to be the church triumphant. But it will have recognized that we need to accept this judgment that God has given, that he has left those nations there. Right. And that we are still being tested. Exactly. Now, when we look at this back on 2022, or Judges 2 to 2, mm -hmm. as the translators would have used this, we would have had Judges 3 1 and Judges 3 4 as verses for our consideration now these are the nations which the lord left to prove israel by them given as many of israel as had not known all the wars of canaan and they were to prove israel by them to know whether they would hearken under the commandments of the lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of moses now we've returned to another question for consideration. Are the Ten Commandments the covenant that God has presented? The premise that I've operated under is no. Well, they're, they're part of it. But they're not the whole thing. Right. Now, the other verses that are, are being approached, Deuteronomy 8.2, 8.16, and 13.3. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee 
these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Who led thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end, along with thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the, God, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Do we today trust the word of the Lord? Do we accept that he is able to do what he has promised he will do? Or are we reliant upon a man, a church, a dogma to tell us what is to happen? What is your opinion today? Do we have faith in God that he is going to do exactly as he's promised he will do? Okay, so I've got another idea, but... Um... Okay. I don't know if it's formed enough here. Well, uh, let me, let's what's the, do the, What's the significance of the 222? Two, two? We, okay, that's that, that one number repeated three times. Okay, and, and it's a doubling? Definitely. A doubling. Is it the second angel's message repeated three times? Okay. Because are we not to give glory to God by our faith in God? Mm -hmm. And is not the message of the rebel of the angel of Revelation 18 a repeat of the second angel's message? Yeah. But you're saying the thought that you have right now is not fully formed. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I'll work it out. But the okay. only thing that I see here is is I believe that this can also relate to time. Uh, and especially the thing that I look at here is, is 2.23, um, which I, we could write as 23.2, the 23rd verse, the second chapter of Judges. Okay, well, let me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you work this out a bit. Because we're going to, we're going to need to discuss some items again for tomorrow. Now, I'm going to ask you all a question. This, this is something that Theodore, you and I started talking about, but we've never really completed. Hang on for a second. Now, one of the comments that, that we shared and that we have addressed in the past mm -hmm. is Rome establishes the vision, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like you, I'd like everybody to consider something. I'm going to share this here in just a second. We understand that 
457 BC is the year that the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. Well, specifically the decree, uh, the co going forth of the commandment to um, is is marking three events: the return of the people and the setting up of the civil authority is the building. Okay. So, as we know Jerusalem. You know the temple was already rebuilt before, and it's really the setting up of the si the city, but also the civil authority. But we know in that period, that forty nine years, thirteen years later, we're going to have the streets and walls built. So it is kind of connected. Okay, but what I'm what I'm looking at here, and the reason why I've, I've denominated that 49 years is the use of Daniel 9, verse 25. Okay. So if I was to do this, just a moment. Now we come down through here. I know I'm scrolling quickly. We come down to Daniel 9, 925. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Mm -hmm. So we have this commandment and we have a denomination of seven weeks and then three score and two weeks. Yeah, so you have a Jubilee cycle then you have the 62 weeks. Okay. Now, Here's this 49 years. We come from 457 to 408 BC. Does that make sense? Well, that's 49, the 49 years. Yeah. Okay. Now, when we take this, this period from 408 BC to the end of what would be the 490 years. We have a time period of 430, or excuse me, from 408 to 27. We right. would so have a- Yeah, so the, the 383 years end in 27. Okay. We, we would have at this point, a period of 434 years from 404 to 27. So in other words, from the end of that jubilee cycle of the 49 years to the point where christ is baptized we have a period of 434 years right yeah is that 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 is a symbol that we've tied right back to the 777 yeah. and it's also double of 217 okay which is the symbol of midnight which is a midpoint and so and it also ties to raphia which isn't 217 in that period. Right. So there's tons of things that about this 434. Okay. But 217, as you just said, is a symbol of midnight. Right? Yep. 217 years from 408 BC brings us to 191 BC. Mm -hmm. 191 BC was the Battle of Thermopylae, where Rome defeated Greece. Several years ago, there was a movie out about this called The 300. Okay, that would be, that's a different thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a different battle. Is Xerxes not Xerxes? Yeah, that's Xerxes. So Thermopylae. Okay, my uh, excuse. 
Yeah, you're just getting two different. Um, My apology. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to confuse people. That I apologize. I stand corrected. Yeah, but, but this, there is the battle that you're talking about is the battle in 191 BC. So that's just a different battle than the 300. The 300 okay. battle with Xerxes. So this is April 24th, 191 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae. Okay. So part of the Roman Seleucid War. Yeah. Okay. Now. What's interesting to me when I looked at this, I'll bring this up. Okay. In 753 BC, we have Rome being founded. And I have sources to point back to that as a point of history. 30 years after Rome is founded, in 723 BC, Israel is taken by Assyria. Have we not addressed that in the past within this movement? Mm -hmm. 30, as I'm looking at this, becomes a, a point that we need to consider. Now, we have spoken in the past that at 30, Christ was baptized. Correct? Yep. As we go through this, please consider that Rome defeats Greece in 191 BC. 30 years later, in 161, using what Smith would use for a chronology, Rome and Jerusalem, Rome and the Jews, enter into a covenant. They enter into a league, which the Jews were not supposed to enter into. Three years after this, in 158, we have the league being noted on the 1843 chart. We have accepted that Christ was born in 4 BC. 30 years later, Christ was baptized, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have this three and a half years three, three and a half, however we want to look at it, before he is cut off, before he is crucified. Mm -hmm. Now, as Stephen was pointing out, we have this 191 years from 1798 to 1989, right? Mm -hmm. Yet when we come to 1989, do we not also have a period of 30 years from the founding of Future for America until 2019, where Future for America get, begins to give a message that is wholly rejected? So we have a 30-year preparation for Future for America to give this message, right? Yep. But now, if we look at this in a pattern, if we are following the pattern of Christ, we would begin in 2019 and if we come then after this message in 2019 goes out, and I believe that was something like November 11th of 2019. Um, what do you mean? It's November 11th. When, when, did, when did Elder Jeff decide to unretire? That's September 7th. Okay. 
My fault. If we went then from September 7th, 2019, and we went three and a half years from then, we would come into a point of the spring of 2023. I'd like to be able to put this out onto a line for tomorrow. Okay. Now, unfortunately, I have to go take care of something very quickly. Okay. So I'm going to unshare this or stop the share and go from there. Okay. So what we would sort of finish off? Please. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Dwight. You bet. I'll be back. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and any thoughts about what we've been studying here? Um, whether it's what Dwight shared or or what we we were looking at uh, before that that Dwight was sharing. Anybody with any thoughts? I know there's a lot of information there. Now, um, 38 years between the 30s. What do you mean by that, Iran? It does, that's too cryptic for me. Between uh, thirty-eight years between 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 what events? Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, so so dealing with um, so thirty-eight between. How do you get 38? I'm not I'm not following. I need to explain that a bit more. I don't know, I could be wrong. I have to go back and look at it. Yeah, okay. So um let me see. I do have his diagrams here. Um if we wanted to look at those. Um, and go back to um, oh, this is going slow. Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. So, so what what uh, Dwight was trying to lay out there is. Uh, this period of time that would relate to um, to the to the period of Rome. Rome establishes the vision. So just just the basic premise of what he's doing is laying out those years to the cross, um, and then taking some of that history. And I don't he didn't really finish, but applying it to our time. Um, what would that mean? Here, I'm, I'm going to bring up his diagrams here. Okay, so I got... I don't know why I can't find them here.
So he sent me these. Okay, so I'll go back to this one. Here. Do it this way. So here you can see this, the founding of Rome. Now, as far as the founding of Rome, it, it's sort of tied up a little bit in mythology. They have it April 21st, 753 BC, and you got story of Romulus and Remus attached to that. So there's some mythological stuff attached to the founding of Rome. But people don't really seem to disagree with that date, um, other than that's that's what's given us. There's no evidence that it's some other date. So he's going to be counting from the founding of Rome. And Stephen had counted from 457 BC, 777 years to 531 AD. So he, he's doing something similar here in laying out this line. Does that make sense to people? That we're going to, what year did you say? 753 BC. I, I might have said it backwards. I mean, like, um, did you say 321 AD? Yeah, isn't it 457 to 321 AD? 777 years? Right, okay, just uh, confirming. Okay, what's marking uh, 531 AD again? Um, that's um, Clovis in, in 508 AD. No, five, said 531 AD. Uh, I don't know 531 AD. 321 AD I thought, is constant. I thought, you mentioned, I thought you mentioned 531. I might have. I might have said numbers. Yeah, well, that's why I was checking. I thought you said 531. Oh, I might have, <laughs> I, I might have said that. Okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah, 521 AD. That's going to be Constantine's Sunday law. And um, so, so Stephen has. So so Dwight's doing something similar. Dwight's back here um, with this. Um, so what's so the premise for starting for 573 BC or 753 BC has to do with Rome establishes the vision. Right. So basically laying out these years of these different events and noting um, that we don't have Christ baptism lining up as 777 years, unless you did an exclusive count. But, right. But, but there is something here that you're trying to see. And, and you tied it in with some other things that we had as well, dealing with uh, things that Stephen had laid out on the line, the 1260 to 1290 the 666 years and the 30 years and the three years. Correct. Now, then you're making an application then to our time with some of this? Yes. Okay. So, so we do have 777 days already in our time. Exactly. Okay. I think basically the the premise that we could come to and we need to examine, is it possible that 2023 is going to be the midnight, the ultimate midnight for the movement and for the world? Okay. So uh, and what would be what would be the things that you do to connect that? Or are we going to look at that tomorrow, maybe? I think we're going to have to look at this tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, and there's other things that I've noticed, too, that um, I want to look at. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of time to work on it, but I'll try to do what I can. Uh, just one little thing, you know, um, this is sort of almost an aside. I was just looking at at Daniel chapter or Daniel, the chapters in Daniel and trying to say, you know, what if these, uh, the chapters, because there's 12 of them represent 12 months. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is Daniel 7, 10, that's the seventh month, the 10th day. Right. It says a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the book was opened. 
And that's the 10th day of the seventh month. It's just one of those witnesses to the idea uh, of the, well, what we do with Bible verses and chapters. But they can represent dates. Right. So, so anyway, that's just, just kind of a, a, another example of that. Okay, well, if you want to close with prayer. We okay. Can... Gracious Father, our minds have been darkened for over 6,000 years of sin. Because of this sin, we do not always recognize that which we should. Because of this sin, we have sought our own way. We have walked outside of the path that you would have us to walk upon. We cannot afford to walk in our own path. We need you to guide us. You have been our ever present, ever faithful shepherd. We need you now more than ever. Be with us today, Father. I thank you for each that has attended this meeting. I pray, Father, that the things that we have addressed, the things that we have discussed, will be of help, will be according to your will, so that your character may indeed be glorified before all of those with whom we come in contact. Direct us now as we go through this day. Help us and guide us so that we may come again tomorrow. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.